So uh, while the kids are going, I want to give Jim and Christy the efficiency award. Their entire family of 11 or 12 was in two seats up there today. <laughs> I wonder if maybe we're in the way of the acts of God, and that's where the trouble comes from. But the point is that there's trouble sometimes that just happens to us, is what I was thinking, and then there's trouble we make for ourselves, and, and probably that's the bigger part of our trouble. We make, we make the trouble for ourselves. And then I thought to myself, how do, we, how do we describe that? What do we call the trouble that we make for ourselves? Um, because I think there's, there's a kind of a tendency to to go one of two directions depending on what we what we call the trouble. Uh, if we if we think in terms of sin, if we call the trouble sin, if we say, well, I've sinned, I've made an error, I've done something wrong, um, then there's a there's a challenge to correct the behavior. To just say, well, I've got to stop behaving that way. If I've made trouble for myself by my bad behavior, then I then if I better behave better. And uh, and that sort of puts the onus of of change on ourselves. If I could only behave well enough, then everything would be right. You know, then, I would, then I would work things out okay. And what I was trying to think is, how do we, how do we get away from an idea that um, all of the Christian life comes down to me behaving better? Because that's, that's a little bit centered on me and, and what I'm doing. So I thought there's another way to describe um, the trouble that comes upon us, and, uh, and, it, and it has to do with what are we worshiping. Not, not how am I behaving, but what am I worshiping? Because in a sense, then, um, my behavior will follow from what I do with my worship time. So I was contrasting in my mind sin on the one hand, bad behavior, and idolatry, bad worship. Um, so then when I thought about that, then I thought to myself, um, the Bible really does talk a lot about idolatry. And why does, it, why does it spend so much time on it? We have this book. This is kind of an interesting thing, I think, anyway. We have this book, the Bible, and we're, and we're kind of told as Christians that all of what we need is going to be in here. This is going to be the thing that's going to teach us about life and, and godliness and uh, give us everything we need. And yet it's got all these thousand-year-old stories in it. And how can that be relevant to modern life? And I think this is a big problem some people have. What's, uh, what's the Bible got to say to me? What's, what's this about? The guy was talking about Achan. <laughs> uh, who even knows about Achan? Right? How, can that, how could that be meaningful to me? Um, there's... There's just an awful lot of idolatry, though, in the Old Testament particularly. There's just all this discussion of the Israelites going after other gods, you know, worshiping idols, and the people in the country that they went to worshiping idols. And what is that all about? I, 
thought I would, I thought I would actually go ahead and read a few passages. Um, I, uh, very familiar passage dealing with idolatry would be um, from the Ten Commandments, from the very start of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So right at the very start of drawing out his people, God feels the need to address this issue of idolatry. I guess we ought to take that a little seriously. We ought to say, well, if, if when he was picking the Israelites, he had to address idolatry, maybe idolatry means something to me today, too. Um, you know the story uh, from Exodus that it wasn't very long before the people were breaking the laws. And uh, in Exodus 32, they made the golden calf when Moses went up on the mountain, and they were scared. They, they hadn't gotten the message about fearing not, I guess. So they asked Aaron to make them, make them something. And in Exodus 32, verses 3 to 4, uh, there's this astounding story. Uh, so all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. They've just, they've just been delivered by God's hand, and they made a calf to say that this was the thing that had, had delivered them out of Egypt. So they really struggled with, with idolatry. Um, when the children of Israel are about to cross over into the promised land, the issue of idolatry comes up again. And so God, uh, God has to warn them that uh, they're going to enter a land where the people serve idols. And in fact, all of the next part of their history, their, the whole, the whole uh, conquering of Canaan and driving out of those peoples is based on those people being idol worshipers. This is uh, from Deuteronomy 18 verses 9 through 12. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices a divination, sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. So then all of Kings and Chronicles and Samuel and all that and all that's faith. And then all of the prophets talk about idols. So uh, the, the, the history of the Israelite people coming into the promised land, it's all uh, wrapped up in this notion that the Canaanites serve idols. And, and I say to myself, I don't know anybody who has a little figurine at home that they bow down to and worship. And yet the Bible talks a lot about it. How am I supposed to make that relevant? So I thought to myself, what, what is it that the idol worshipers in the Old Testament get out of it? You know, there's, there's kind of a, there's an interesting thing as you read sometimes. You read about history and you read about people who lived in other generations. And there's sort of this notion that, well, they were simple people. They were just kind of, you know, they weren't modern like us. They didn't know what we know. And so their ideas must have just been very simple, you know, bad ideas. They were ignorant or something like that. And I'm thinking to myself, these are people who could live off the land. These are people who could scratch a living out of the earth and survive. Uh, these are people who could do without a car and a cell phone and the technology that I depend on. So for me to say that they were dumb and simple and ignorant seems wrong somehow. They must have had some kind of sophistication in their way of thinking. Um, although clearly, it was disordered at some level too. But the point is, people who do wrong things aren't just dumb and ignorant. They're trying to get at a good thing, but they just don't know the right way of getting at it. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not some sophistication. It doesn't mean they're not trying to get at something that's reasonably good. Here's a couple, uh, here's a couple references to try to figure out what it is that people try to get out of idols. In Genesis 31, verse 19, there's this, uh, there's this interesting uh, reference as Jacob is leaving his stepfather's household. Uh, maybe some of you remember this story, story. Genesis 31, 19. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household gods. And nobody knows exactly what this means, uh, as I looked at different commentaries and things like that. But there are several references to Rachel taking the household gods, so presumably little figurines, and hiding them. She's actually putting them on, on them in the tent when she didn't get up when her, when her father came in. Um, there's sort of a hint here that there's something about family identity, family inheritance, something like that, that was connected to these figurines, these idols. So stealing them was, in a way, trying to, to get the inheritance. 
get the uh, uh, angel. Okay. So something about idolatry has to do with um, with identity in some kind of a sense. If we look at uh, there's another passage, Second Chronicles 28. Um, Second Chronicles 28, verse 22. In his time of trouble, King Ahaz became even more unfaithful to the Lord. He offered sacrifices to the gods of Damascus, who had defeated him. Damascus is in Syria, interesting, isn't it? Syria is in Israel. Uh, since he, uh, he thought, uh, since the gods of the kings of Aram, uh, that was the king of Damascus, have helped him, helped, uh, helped them, I will sacrifice uh, to them so they will help me. But they were his downfall and the downfall of all Israel. So somehow Ahaz had this sense that the gods of a certain place, the, the idols that are attached to a certain locality, could show their strength in terms of like a military conquest or something like that. So he's going to offer to the gods of, of uh, Syria. A couple of hints that people used idolatry to establish themselves uh, a sense of family, a sense of place, a sense of identity. Okay. So that's, that seems to be one thing that, that people got out of idol worship. Um, in the book of Hosea, chapter 4, there's a really disturbing reference that tells something else people try to get out of idolatry. Everybody know where Hosea is at? Those darn minor prophets. <laughs> it's in the Bible someplace. It's on page 709. <laughs> Hosea 4. Hosea comes what? After Daniel, before Amos? Is that about right? <laughs> Hosea 4, 10. They will eat but not have enough. They'll engage in prostitution but not increase because they have deserted the Lord to give themselves to prostitution. You read sometimes in the Bible about these temple, uh, these Canaanite practices of, of like ritual prostitution. You think, how, how bizarre. What kind of people were these? Um, but the hint here from Hosea is that their goal was was to be fertile. Their goal was to multiply and increase and occupy their place. <laughs> they thought that somehow ritual prostitution would help them have bigger families or, or more prosperity or something like that. Uh, family and prosperity is not a bad goal, but they were going about it in a very, very bizarre way. But that seemed to be what was at the root of the idol practices. In fact, if you think about the whole, um, the whole episode uh, in Kings where Elijah's uh, interacting with the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, Remember the story, he goes up there, and, and uh, he's the only one left of the prophets of the Lord, but there's these 450 prophets of Baal that uh, Jezebel is, is supporting. And uh, he says, uh, you make a sacrifice to Baal, uh, but don't light the fire, and we'll see if Baal comes and, and lights the fire. And, of course, he doesn't. And he says, I'll make a sacrifice to, to Yahweh, and we'll see if he lights the fire, and Yahweh does. What was the whole point of that? Do you remember what the context was? That there was a drought, so that so there's a drought in the land and the crops aren't growing. So the whole context of this contest between the true God and the idol worshipers was about getting the rain to come back again. So what was that about? Well, that's about productivity. That's about how are we gonna make our living? How are we gonna eat? Okay. So again, not a bad goal to have, have uh, a productive life, not a bad goal to have something to eat, just going about it in the wrong way. Um, identity and productivity seem to be some of the big goals of idol worshipers. So then was, I thought to myself, am I any different than an idol worshiper? What, what do I want out of life? Um, would I not say that what I'd really like out of life is, a, is an identity? I'd like, I'd like to be known as something. Uh, don't I want a productive life? Don't I want to have a family and make a living? So in a sense, the goals in my life are no different than And I guess the question uh, that I, I made to myself is, am I going about getting those things in any different way fundamentally than an idol worshiper is? How, uh, uh, how do I go about doing that? Do I, do I make elaborate schemes in my life for providing my self-identity? Um, do I say, well, even if I don't always tell the truth, if I can convince people that I tell the truth, then they'll think I'm a good guy. So I've just got to maintain the image. Uh, do I sometimes find myself uh, telling elaborate stories or, or uh, doing things for show? 